Thank you very much, Asti. Can you hear me okay? Hope so. Yes. Good morning to everyone in the UK and good afternoon to everyone in Southeast Asia. As part of BritCham's ongoing commitment to lead the way in respect of chambers in Indonesia with regard to facilitating an ongoing dialogue and education regarding climate change, Last year, we embarked on a series of webinars with the UN and the United Nations Sustainability Goals Business Avengers, who are the, the global corporates leading each of the 17 sustainability goals. The purpose of these webinars is to understand how these global companies are driving initiatives within their organization for the wider benefit of all stakeholders relating to climate change. Today, I have the good fortune to combine the subject of climate change with one of my favorite business sectors, namely the spirit sector which obviously includes whiskey. I join you today live from Jakarta's newest whiskey club and bar, The Oak Room. In my home country of Scotland, the word whiskey is derived from the Scottish Gaelic whiskey bar, which means water of life. So it's entirely appropriate that today's guests from Diageo PLC are part of a company that's leading the UN sustainability goal number six relating to water conservation. Joining me today from Diageo are two special guests. Firstly, from the UK, Kate Gibson, Diageo's Global Society Director. Kate leads the global, the global Diageo and Society team responsible for ensuring Diageo makes a positive contribution to society across its full value chain. She leads a team who collaborate with business units and functions across Diageo to reduce environmental impacts with a focus on decarbonization and water stewardship to make a positive difference in local communities and promote responsible drinking. Those efforts play an important role in helping Diageo to deliver its ambition to be the best performing, most trusted and respected consumers product company in the world. Prior to joining Diageo, Kate worked at Intercontinental Hotels Group, IHG, as Vice President Global Corporate Responsibility with global accountability for IHG's environmental sustainability agenda, community impact programs and disaster relief activities, as well as leading on stakeholder engagement and non-financial reporting. She started her career as a strategy consultant. Kate played a leading role in corporate strategy projects for clients across the consumer products, financial services, manufacturing and pharmaceutical industries in the UK, Europe, and the USA. Kate holds a bachelor's degree from McGill University in Canada and a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Secondly, we welcome a very familiar face to Britcham members, Dendi Borman, the Corporate Relations Director of Diageo Indonesia. Dendi has extensive experience in government and, and non-government engagement, as well as advocacy in shaping public policy. He has a deep knowledge on Indonesia's political uh, environment uh, and dynamics and how they will Im impact regulatory environment. He has been working for Diageo for seven years in corporate relations, in which he has responsibility in shaping public policy, educating consumers, as well as developing and implementing the sustainability ag agenda. Dendi is also actively involved in BritCham and EuroCham, as well as other organizations such as the Indonesian Spirits and Wine Association, ISWA, and APINDO, the Indonesian Employers Association. He serves as the ex uh, on the executive committee of the Indonesia Malt Beverage Association, GIMI. Dendi is looking forward to continue his, no his nomination as a Rich and Board member. He is confident that he can, he can contribute in leveraging the advocacy role and building Rich Am as a trusted and reliable partner with the Indonesian government as well as promoting UK business in Indonesia. Uniquely, at the end of last year, in recognition of his superb work spearheading much of the advocacy on behalf of the spirit sector in Indonesia, Dendi was appointed as a global Scot, and indeed he's the first Indonesian citizen to receive this honor. Finally, I would also like to pay thanks to Britcham's supporting partners today, Scotch Whiskey Association and Scottish Development International. To start this off, what I would like to do is um, give Kate Gibson an opportunity to explain more about uh, the Agile sustainability agenda. Um, she's got a short presentation and a video, and then after that, we will move into the 
the fireside chat, um, which will take about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So, Kate, um, I would welcome, first of all, and welcome, Dendy. Um, I very much look forward to this session. As I say, it combines two of my favorite subjects. Uh, so, Kate, over to you um, to set the scene and, and explain a little bit more about the Agile Sustainability Agenda. Great. Thanks very much, Ainsley, and I'm um, really happy to, to be here and just really delighted that this series of conversations is happening, um, you know, and, and particularly now in this very, very unique time we find ourselves in, uh, obviously living through this unprecedented pandemic and also in this a really critical year uh, in the lead up to, to COP26. So it's, it's fantastic to, to be able to speak with you. So what I wanna do very quickly um, is just set the scene uh, in terms of uh, Diageo's overall approach to societal impact. Um, as Ainsley mentioned, uh, you know, what our, our overall ambition uh, as a company is to be one of the most trusted and respected consumer products uh, companies in the world. And, and I guess as someone in my career who's been working uh, really at the crossroads of corporate strategy and, um, and societal impact, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's important and it's sort of embedded in our performance ambition that these two aspects go hand in hand. Um, so if we just go to the next slide, uh, obviously we find ourselves uh, in very interesting times. Uh, in addition to living through a pandemic, we're in the decade of action. Uh, so that's the, the final decade to deliver the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and certainly what was clear even back at the turn of the decade before the pandemic uh, at Davos, for example, in, in January 2020, is that progress against the, the Sustainable Development Goals is not proceeding at anywhere near the pace uh, that it needs to be uh, in order for us to create the future we want to see. Um, and I think uh, the pandemic has just further highlighted, uh, I guess, the fragility, as we all know, uh, of the systems and, and, and really the need to think uh, much more long term uh, and, and really think sustainably, uh, not, not as a nice to have, but really as, as you know, it's critical for uh, the resilience and recovery of business, uh, of communities and, and societies as a whole. And I think one thing that certainly has uh, been building for a long time, but has really accelerated uh, is the role of the private sector. Uh, in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, both as industries, across industries, um, and then across society in helping to deliver the goals. And this obviously creates risk uh, for those companies that are uh, slow to act, but also opportunities for businesses um, that are willing to set really bold ambitions um, and really create that platform for innovation uh, and a deeper connection. Um, and certainly one thing I'm sure we've all observed, um, you know, as we continue to live through this, this crisis is just, um, you know, the, 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 the very, very mainstream consciousness now of, of a lot of issues that around sustainability that might have been um, maybe a bit more niche, uh, even 18 or 24 months ago. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, I see that as very encouraging. I see the recognition of, uh, of the climate crisis, of the water crisis, and of the pandemic. Um, kind of coming together and coming into consciousness as a very uncomfortable thing, but a very necessary thing. Um, and particularly in the lead up to COP26, um, you know, we've got a real moment here. Um, so again, it's great that this conversation uh, is happening. So I guess that backdrop, um, and as we came to the end of uh, a series of sustainability targets and community impact targets uh, that were set back in 2008, um, we were really thinking about what we want to do next uh, and what our 10 year ambition is uh, to, to deliver this positive impact on society. Um, and that's what I wanted to share with you now. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned before, um, Diageo's ambition has as its core, uh, our, our aim to be most trusted, best performing and most trusted and respected. Um, and then there's a real recognition that we can't uh, be best performing uh, without having a really strong uh, positive impact on society everywhere that we operate. And likewise, we can't be, um, we can't deliver that societal impact that uh, most trusted and respected if we don't have the performance. So the, the two of them are, are really inextricably linked. So as we were putting um, together the strategy, uh, the idea very much was saying, this isn't something that is separate to our ambition as a company. Uh, this is the 10 year roadmap um, for us to deliver these priorities. Um, and we have six priorities as a company. And this is very much the roadmap around, uh, around three of them, which is around our work to promote positive drinking, our work to champion uh, inclusion and diversity, 
um, and that's within our company, but also with our supply chain uh, in our communities and for society as a whole. Um, and then also our work to pioneer grain to glass uh, sustainability. Um, and this, this idea of pioneering is very important. It's very, um, it's very ingrained in, in, in the language we use as a company and in our, our spirit as a company around uh, being pioneering, which is around setting out on a journey where you don't know um, exactly what the destination is going to be and, and actually how you're going to get there. Uh, and that, that, that sort of sense of uh, be, being willing, willing to be bold in the face of uncertainty. Um, and as part of that, the themes we have, um, and Ainsley, you mentioned at the beginning, our role as the uh, business avenger for STG6, uh, clean water and sanitation. So is, is a really around preserving water uh, for life. And as a beverage company operating globally, uh, including in water stressed areas, that's absolutely uh, critical for us that we uh, take action within our own company, but that we're very vocal advocates uh, for water uh, to accelerate to a low carbon world. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and then to become sustainable um, by design. Um, and then all that is built on a foundation of doing business the right way uh, from grain to glass. That's what our stakeholders expect. That's what uh, you know, we within Diageo expect, and that's what we live up to um, every day. So if we just go on to um, the next slide, I wanted to share uh, just a little bit of a video um, that just brings to life some of our targets. We are a company built by entrepreneurs and people of extraordinary character. Since Arthur Guinness signed a 9,000 year lease and John Walker and Son sent the finest whiskey from Scotland to the world, we've had ambition. The spirit of progress is our 10 year action plan to help create a more inclusive and sustainable world. We want to change the way the world drinks for the better by celebrating moderation and continuing to address alcohol-related harm. In the next decade, we will reach one billion people with messages of moderation from our brands and educate people on alcohol-related harm through our global Drink IQ platform. Our alcohol education program, Smashed, will educate over 10 million people on the dangers of underage drinking and we will also change the attitudes towards drink driving of 5 million people. Championing inclusion and diversity is core to our purpose, and we want the diversity of our customers and consumers to be reflected in the people who shape our business. Our ambition is to achieve 50% representation of women in leadership roles, with 45% of our leaders from ethnically diverse backgrounds. We will also help support a thriving and inclusive hospitality sector, providing skills and training to 1.7 million people through Diageo Bar Academy and Learning for Life. We are also going further to preserve the natural resources on which we all depend. We will reach net zero carbon across our operations, switching our sources of direct energy to be 100% renewable, and we will reduce the carbon in our supply chain by 50%. Water is critical to life and our business, and we will lead collective action to preserve the world's water. Every drink we make will use 30% less water than it does today, and by 2026, we'll replenish more water than we use in water-stressed areas delivering over 150 community water projects around the world. We will also make sure that 60% of our packaging will be made from recycled material and 100% of our packaging will be widely recyclable. We will also develop innovative partnerships to help create a more circular economy and we will help to regenerate and restore the landscapes and resources we rely on supporting smallholder farmers with agricultural skills. We are passionate about the role our brands play in celebrating life the world over. We have a responsibility to grow our business in the right way, from grain to glass, and a responsibility to ensure our people, partners, and communities can thrive. This is how we will continue to celebrate life every day, everywhere. 
Society 2030. Celebrate the spirit of progress. So yeah, that, so that was just a, a little bit of an overview of, uh, of the 25 targets that we released uh, back in November. Um, and it's, it was really, it was a really interesting experience um, sort of being in the final stages of, uh, of, um, of coming up and finalizing the targets and the strategy right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I think one thing that I would say is the, the sort of commitment. Uh, it's really, we talk about a ripple effect. So we talk about where are all the different ways um, that we can actually have a positive impact, be it uh, directly in our own operations, be it through, um, through collaboration across sectors, like with the Scotch Whiskey Association, for example, uh, with our supply chain, with our communities. And then also what is the role that our brands can play in shaping um, societal attitudes and, and sort of being in culture as well. Um, and, and I think what was, what was great um, that what we observed certainly during, during the pandemic is far from seeing you know, many organizations sort of pulling back from, uh, from, from being bold and from innovating. There actually was lots of organizations, including ourselves, leaning into the challenges that we face, but also the opportunities in being bold. Um, so as I mentioned before, as we were framing the targets, um, each include within them an innovation gap. Um, so this pioneering spirit, not being totally sure how we're going to achieve all of these, um, but recognizing it's the right thing to do, um, to set bold targets, to, to inspire others, um, and also to send a signal uh, in terms of some of the way that the market needs to develop uh, to make these things possible. Um, so we'll be talking, I think, a little bit more just with regards to, to our net zero ambition and our supply chain. Um, but as we think about, um, you know, ourselves, especially as Diageo, we're obviously, we're, a, we're, a, we're an alcohol uh, company, you know, we're, that's the, the products that we're selling. Um, and we're a global company as well. So with um, 200 brands in 180 countries, um, we're also a young co uh, company. So the parent company itself is not that old, but our brands have this incredibly long heritage. So you heard uh, in the video there about Arthur Guinness signing a 9,000 year lease or uh, for example, the Johnny Walker brand celebrated 200 years uh, last year. And so one of the questions that we asked ourselves is, you know, what would those entrepreneurial uh, visionary uh, brand founders do? What would Arthur Guinness do? And with a 9,000 year lease, um, you would really think long term. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Um, and I guess a few, um, just a few sort of highlights here, I guess, as we think um, certainly around, you know, how do we create an inclusive society? Um, you know, we definitely view that in terms of uh, within our company, in terms of female leadership and, and leaders from ethnically diverse backgrounds. But we also really thinking about what's our role in terms of our supply chain and also uh, communities. And as the hospitality sector uh, begins to emerge from the pandemic, it's uh, thinking about what can we do to, to build that back better? So how can we make moderation the norm? Uh, how can we make it a truly inclusive society? And, and how could we also um, make it a sector where uh, sustainability is the norm um, as well? And then also in terms of water. So, and as the business avenger for uh, SDG6, um, we're very aware and the pandemic has really reinforced the fact that, um, that, that water is such a precious resource and is so unevenly shared across the planet. Um, and so we, we do find ourselves in a water crisis, uh, you know, where, 785 million people don't have access, uh, easy access to, to fresh water, to clean water. Um, and that's obviously the first uh, line of defense in terms of um, protection against the current pandemic, but also future shocks um, that may come. Um, and so that's why we've really set this uh, bold ambition in terms of uh, water efficiency. And that's building on uh, work we've done over uh, improving water efficiency over the past 10 years. Um, and then also replenishing 100% uh, of the water that we use uh, in water stressed areas. Um, so anyway, that was just a, a bit of a backdrop, I guess, I suppose, in terms of the, the bold targets, but also this idea uh, of an innovation gap. And then one thing we've also done um, is we've, we've launched Diageo Sustainable Solutions at the same time. And that's a, that's a fund that allows us to partner with different organizations in terms of developing uh, some of the solutions to these challenges and, and to help us address um, the innovation gap. Because we certainly recognize that uh, the challenges we face are not something that we can do on our own. Uh, it requires partnership, it requires collaboration across uh, sectors and within sectors, um, and it also requires uh, you know, new approaches and technologies um, to be developed. So if we go on to quickly to the next slide, um, obviously, you know, in the context of this, um, 
uh, this series of discussions. So we, we have um, set a target uh, and, and an ambition to accelerate to a low carbon world. Um, Diageo was an early adopter of uh, absolute carbon reduction uh, targets, and we did that back in 2008. And up to 2020, we'd already reduced our, um, our absolute carbon uh, emissions across our direct operations by more than 50%, um, and then across our, our value chain by more than 30%. Um, so in many ways, the, a lot of the, the, the low hanging fruit, if you will, has been harvested in terms of that. Um, but our commitment going forward is to, is to go further uh, and to achieve net zero carbon um, by 2030 in our direct operations. And we'll do that through a, a number of uh, levers that we'll pull. The first is around um, energy efficiency through manufacturing excellence. That makes good business sense. That's about resilience. That's about cost optimization. And that's about making sure the business is fit for the future. Uh, it's also shifting to 100% renewable electricity. And that's a journey that we've been on for a long time. Um, we're a signatory of the RE100 initiative. Um, and we're, many parts of our business are already um, operating with 100% uh, renewable electricity, uh, the UK, for example, being, being one aspect. Um, and then the real challenge for us and across, um, across those that are distilling and brewing as we are, um, is really around heat. Yeah, so that's the majority of, uh, of the energy load that we need. So that's really around uh, decarbonizing that is around innovating new approaches to on-site uh, generation of uh, renewable heat, um, particularly from co-products and from biomass. Um, and that's something that companies in other sectors are doing. Uh, and we've been innovating in that area since 2008. Uh, we've made a number of investments across Scotland um, over the past decade, and we've taken those learnings uh, and are applying it to Africa as well. Um, and then working uh, over time to decarbonize all of the sites that we operate. Um, and then in terms of our value chain, it's really around working with our suppliers around decarbonizing our value chain. So a further 50% reduction by 2030. Um, and again, this is, this is an almighty challenge that society has to face. So it will require uh, innovation, it will require dedication, um, and it will require collaboration. But I think that the good news in, in, in that I, as far as I see is the more companies that commit to net zero, uh, the more countries that come out with net zero uh, commitments, uh, the more we have an unstoppable uh, move towards this uh, future that we need to create. So that was just a bit of a whistle stop tour of the strategy and, and certainly look forward to chatting with you and, and hearing some questions. And I think now I'm going to pass over to Dendi, who's going to share a bit about our work in Indonesia. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. And uh... <clears throat> Just continue that in Indonesia, we surely uh, <coughs> embedded and value the uh, target of society 2030s, as uh, Kate have broadly explained, into our community based sustainable ecotourism at Kambu Village in Bali, where uh, we have our uh, plan operated. So, as our philosophy is growth with community where we operate, so we deliver. <coughs> Many programs, many programs in terms of uh, support to improve the livelihood of uh, local farmers in Nyambu village. So they have the small skills, just not just uh, as a regular uh, agricultural village, but they have the added, added value to become a sustainable ecotourism village as well. <clears throat> and of course, we're through the, the uh, various trainings that include waste management, uh, microfinance, basic English skill, and even guidings. We try to improve, not to get the locals have uh, additional skills to improve their income, to improve their uh, their uh, livelihood as well. So, and one of the examples that also this has become a main concern in Bali is regarding the plastic waste. So we try, we started, we initiate uh, the hashtag berubah dari rumah or change start from homes in Yambu and spread out across Bali. Hopefully it could be involved more and more uh, either private sectors, communities, NGOs that we work together to make Bali a better place for uh, sustainable tourism. So in the next slide, I just want to show you our little initiative in Yambu where we support uh, the waste management program. Dulu tuh 
masih sangat sembarang orang tuh nggak peduli yang penting sampahnya jauh dari rumahnya mau plastik masih gampang kita temui di pinggir jalan kok sekarang udah lumayan berkurang yang pasti sekarang kan udah mulai dikembangkan bank sampah jadi orang-orang itu udah mulai memilah sampah-sampahnya sendiri gitu kalau dulu itu masih kebuang kemana-mana gitu kalau sekarang tuh masih di tahap pemilahan aja pemisahan uh, semoga dengan program ini masyarakat le- jadi lebih sadar untuk menjaga lingkungannya gitu. tidak hanya mementingkan kepentingan kepentingan pribadi tapi juga mikirin untuk ke masa depannya itu setiap bulan kami akan mengadakan pembersihan lingkungan secara massal nah itu juga gunanya untuk menjaga lingkungan kami supaya tetap asri, supaya tetap indah, dan nah juga untuk me- menunjang kegiatan ekowisata ini. Nah itu lingkungan di sini sangat eh, apa namanya tidak tidak bagus karena di samping infrastruktur yang rusak, masyarakat juga enggan untuk merawat lingkungan dan juga eh, sampah plastik. bisa kita temukan sangat mudah sekali waktu itu setelah pelatihan atau beberapa pelatihan yang kami uh, lewati ya kebiasaan penduduk atau kebiasaan kami sudah sedikit mulai berubah dimana kami sudah mulai peduli dengan lingkungan dengan terutama dengan sampah plastik plastik itu tidak akan bisa habis dalam ratusan tahun tidak akan bisa diolah di dalam tanah sehingga itu harus di recycle pelestarian atau keberlanjutan nah menurut pemahaman saya itu adalah seperti halnya hidup ini nah hidup ini kita harus berlangsung harus berlanjut nah dari saya nah kemudian akan di dilanjutkan oleh anak saya kemudian anak saya akan me- melahirkan generasi-generasi baru terus seperti itu ya yeah, and with that uh, short videos thank you and- Thank you, Dendi, and and thank you, Kate. Some very ambitious targets there. I, I mean, I associate the spirit sector with more sort of traditional production processes that haven't changed over the years. Very interesting to hear that innovation is going to be a real key focus over the next ten uh, years. Um, and Kate also mentioned that uh, companies that embrace these sustainability ch- challenges and are ambitious with them are the ones that are likely to thrive and prosper. What I would like to, to ask her is um, in relation from a consumer perspective, how is that resonating with the consumers? Do the consumers understand uh, what you're doing and uh, are consumer choices being influenced by what you're doing? Or is that varying from market to market? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that, Kate? Yeah, Inzo, I think that's a great question, and it's. I think it's certainly what we're seeing is a continuation of a trend that's been building for some time. In the sense that um, the, these issues that perhaps have been in the sort of far off horizon are now, you know, definitely being felt day to day. You know, and that's particularly true for for climate change. Um, you know, and the climate emergency, which is starting to to actually impact people's day to day lives. You know, around around the world in different ways. But also, you know, certainly the topic of waste that we were just um, seeing there, and so we've done some um, research. As you know, any any consumer products company needs to be in touch with with its consumers, and we've done it across a number of different markets, um, and including in Indonesia. And I think what we've seen is there is a growing awareness. Um, I think there is a desire to do something, but I think there is also um, a real expectation around, um, you know, brands uh, taking authentic action. Um, and and having a conversation with the consumer, um, and certainly that's something that we're seeing. And and one of the things that we thought about as we as we were developing Spirit of Progress, and we were thinking about this ripple effect we want to cause, it is around how do we use our brands to shape 
uh, societal attitudes and also to kind of engage with consumers. Um, and there's a couple of examples of things that we've done recently. Um, and, you know, I guess one example would be around the Johnny Walker brand in the context of the 200th anniversary um, last year is there was an announcement around a commitment to, um, to plant a million trees um, in the four corners of Scotland. And that's obviously really important for the Johnny Walker brand around, um, you know, being, being a blended Scotch whiskey and, and coming from uh, all the different corners of Scotland, that, that real authentic commitment to preserving and helping to regenerate the land and a real recognition that, um, you know, that, that, that this symbiosis, you know, we, our business is so dependent upon uh, the natural resources um, in Scotland for Johnny Walker and then around the world. And I guess a couple of other examples, um, one is around the Talisker brand, um, which is all about the sea. Um, and a, a recent NGO partnership announced um, with Parlay, which is around the conservation um, and the rewilding of the seas. And again, that, that really resonates because that's so close to the character and the DNA of the brand. Um, and that's certainly something that we've seen as being really important. You know, it's very important for brands to, to take action. It's very important for brands to walk the walk and talk, and talk the talk. Uh, in that order, but also it has to link with the brand or else it, it rings hollow. And I think another really good example of, of this dialogue with consumers is actually around, you know, responsible drinking and how we use our brands. Um, so we're really, we're trying to make moderation the norm. Our aim is for people to drink better and not more. And that's, you know, really close to our strategy as a premium a drinks company. So the Guinness brand in the context of uh, the Six, Na Six Nations Rugby uh, Championships, where we were a headline sponsor, um, you may have heard of the Guinness Clear campaign. And that was quite simple. It was basically saying, you know, have a pint of Guinness Clear, right? So water, um, you know, and uh, and moderate your drinking effectively so you can continue to enjoy the game and, and, and have, a, have a more mindful, have a better experience. But that was a good example of using the brand tone of voice to actually reach consumers in a different way than just saying drink responsibly. Um, so that's really authentic to the brand. And, and that campaign you know, was, was multi-award winning. And also, uh, you know, when you look at the statistics on that campaign was actually more engaging than many of other, our other sort of traditional campaigns as well. So it's a good example of helping to build the brand and the connection with the consumers, but doing it in a way that's also um, shaping societal attitudes. Um, so that's definitely something I see becoming more and more important uh, going forward. Okay, th thank you, Kate. Um, I want to drill down a little bit more on one of your one of your brands. My favorite uh, whiskey is Oban, which I understand is one of yours. And uh, there's a photograph of my CEO visiting your distillery. By CEO, I mean the CEO of my household. Um, we, I go there probably every couple of years. And I was intrigued to read that the Oban distillery became carbon neutral at the end of 2020. Uh, and I really want to, to understand more about this. How do you actually measure the carbon neutrality? Is it, is it strictly limited to the, four, the operations within the four walls of the distillery? Does it extend to the supply base for that distillery? or even the emissions associated with consumption and logistics? And what yeah, are no, the things will you be taking at other sites to, to decarbonize them as well? Yeah, no, it's a really great question. And it really, I, I love, I'm obviously delighted to hear that, um, you know, that's a, that's a favorite product of, of yours. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the scope of that, and, the, and yes, the announcement was for, for this uh, distillery to be carbon neutral by the end of 2020. So this refers to the operations on site. Um, and this is part of the, the, the journey that we've been on since, uh, you know, for, for more than a decade uh, in terms of decarbonizing our operations. Um, so what we've done here is, um, uh, is we've really pulled these three levers um, very hard. So the first is around, um, you know, efficiency through manufacturing excellence. And that's something that we do at all of our sites. Um, and that's, again, really good for business and, you know, great for resilience. Um, we've then shifted to renewable electricity. Um, and again, where, where, wherever possible, we're doing that as quickly as we can. And, and all of our sites in the UK are on 100% renewable electricity. And then we've modified the boilers on site uh, so that they're able to use uh, biofuel for, for the generation of heat. And then, we, we in, and then we, for, the, for the remaining carbon, um, we use carbon credits uh, in order to get that to be carbon neutral. So it is, it is the, the on-site uh, generation. So it's what you call scope one and two. It doesn't include uh, the value chain, the full value chain, so scope three. Um, but what we do there, and, and our commitment there is by 2030 to 
build on what we've already done in terms of a 30% reduction across the value chain up to 2020 and to go for a further 50% reduction. Uh, we tend to do that across uh, brands and that really involves working with our, with our suppliers in terms of how we can uh, help them and work with them to decarbonize the value chain. Uh, Dan, just uh, Dandy, what, what the initiatives like the ones at uh, the Oban Distillery in the west coast of Scotland, are you doing similar things here in Indonesia in your Bali facility? Yes, as Anslid, uh, we definitely have that uh, similar commitment on reducing carbon prints. So we have uh, the, the similar target that uh, by net zero emission energy on uh, by 2030s, so, so far we have, uh, since 2017, we have reduced 58% of course of the uh, carbon emission and also water preservations in our uh, plant in Bali. Sure, it's still work in progress and we still uh, have a strong commitment on that. Uh, what about renewable energy? Yeah, it's still a small initiative, but we already planned some of uh, solar-based uh, uh, sorry, solar power based uh, device in our uh, facility currently, and mm -hmm. it's still uh, it's still a, a step by step, but we already started that. Yeah, the regulations are becoming a little bit more favorable. Yeah, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to just go. I'm conscious of time. I want to go on to a, a, an issue that's quite pertinent to Indonesia. And Indi countries like Indonesia have extensive challenges with land use, given high population growth, high rates of urbanization, and generally low rates of agricultural productivity associated with smallholders, all of which contribute to climate change challenges. One of the aspects of Diageo's grain to glass strategy is to work with smallholders to boost regenerative agriculture and biodiversity. Um, can Diageo expand upon how they aim to achieve this? And in Indonesian context, what specific crops regions will they be focusing on? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think one of the things um, certainly that uh, is, you know, again, starting to really enter that mainstream conversation is the role of agriculture, uh, you know, in terms of contribution, uh, you know, to climate change. Um, but also to the potential solutions. So, um, in terms of our strategy, what we're um, what we're doing in, in the in the early years of our ten year roadmap is really building on the work that we've done, uh, particularly with smallholder farmers in Africa over a number of years. Um, so we obviously have the direct connections there, um, and then the aim is to build out um, you know the innovation and the learnings to other regions um, over time. And so this really builds on the work that we already do in terms of provision of seeds and advice and financial support, um, and then is really building out a wider package of support in terms of, um, you know, what other things are needed in terms of moving to the regenerative space, um, and then also in terms of broader climate resilience. Um, so we're actually working at the moment uh, in Kenya on, a, on a, a qualitative impact study to really understand um, you know, what, what is going on and, and what uh, additional uh, aspects of, of, of the support will be the most effective. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is through, I mentioned um, the launch of Diageo Sustainable Solutions, um, which launched in November uh, last year. And uh, as part of the first cohort of um, projects that we'll be engaging in is one specifically focused around smallholder farmers and, um, and innovations in terms of, uh, of, of water efficiency and, 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 and irrigation and really making sure that that precision uh, techniques can help to, um, to, to boost yields and boost resilience as well. So it's, it's, you know, it's a 10 year journey. Um, and so certainly in the early years, there's a lot of focus, um, a lot of focus in Africa with the aim of really sharing those learnings uh, across the patch. Yeah, to add, in Indonesia. To add on that, on the Indonesia context, uh, and slide, that's why through our initiative in ecotourism project, project, we support the small farmers uh, with the additional skills, etc. So we know we are aware that Bali, with more and more massive tourism, is just kind of push away all the uh, small farmers because of the massive tourism. That's why it become the initiative to support the local farmers. Started small with uh, our uh, surrounding our facilities in Bali, but it's uh, uh, amplifying cross out Bali and probably wider area. So with these supports on trainings, capacity building, and etc., we try to 
the uh, community, local community could assess what the should be the richness of their village, the heritage. We know that Nyambu is one of the oldest village in Bali with 22 springs and more than 64 of uh, small temples. And it's existed since the 12th centuries. So with that, like Kate mentioned, our water preservation is also embedded in that. And how we partner with local people, how do we maintain this uh, water resources and how we could utilize not just of course, for the uh, benefit for all the community and not just on our facility itself. So we hope that by doing this initiative, we could engage more and more, uh, even the governments, non-governments, we some certain level work with the uh, local NGO, with British Council as well, with Copernic, Yayasan Wisnu, and I think uh, to get more, and even we have the opportunity to uh, partners uh, Sorry for because of the pandemic, but we have the opportunity to partner with the one of the IHD, uh, the five star hotel chains also in Bali. How to be uh, amplify this initiative? Okay, uh, uh, you also made reference to a commitment to use 100% re recycled uh, content and packaging. This is easier said than done in many markets and and uh, a number of markets the the collection of waste is much better regulated and there's a, uh, there's a good system in, in, in place. In Indonesia, the collection of waste is, is quite sporadic. It's unregulated in many areas. Uh, and also I'm intrigued, most of your packaging is glass with, uh, with uh, multi-layer plastic labels, if, if I look at what I see here. Um, how do you intend to achieve that target of having 100% re recyclable content in packaging? Will your packaging change? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's, this is a good example of, um, of the innovation gap, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, recognizing, you know, the issues to be addressed. And I think as we thought about this uh, in terms of packaging, um, this is one of the reasons why the theme we have around here is, is, is talking about being sustainable by design. And what that's already doing is allowing for a conversation between uh, the supply chain and the brand teams and, you know, a much wider set of, uh, of people within the company to say, okay, right, if we're trying to be sustainable by design, let's uh, really have that conversation earlier on. Uh, and, and figure out, you know, ways that we can actually innovate. So there's a couple of different ways. So, you know, you mentioned glass, you know, which is, which is a great material, um, you know, in terms of recyclability, um, but for example, you know, weight of glass. So, you know, what can we do in terms of lightweight in glass yeah. and how can we innovate that? Um, and then we've also talked about, um, you know, one of the things that we've, we've done recently is uh, thinking about an alternative to, uh, to plastics in terms of a paper bottle. Uh, so you may have seen the announcement that we, we announced um, the world's first, uh, you know, paper bottle uh, from, from fully sustainable sources. Uh, so that's a good example of, of, of really innovating around, um, around the challenge. So how can you create smaller formats um, you know, in a material that's more sustainable. And I think the final thing I would say, um, and this is where I think it's helpful actually to have more and more companies coming out with very bold ambitions is, you know, we have set a target to have 100% recycled plastic in the plastic packaging that we use by 2030. Now, the market for that doesn't fully exist at the moment, but by doing that, we're also helping to and hoping to stimulate uh, the market for recycled plastic, you know, and, and think the more companies that 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 set that ambition it creates a marketplace for recycling and i think you're right to talk about um you know the the, the challenges at a very local level so i think some of some of the work that we're doing um you know with regards to the ecotourism uh, project in in bali is helpful and we've we've seen similar um similar benefits in other parts of in other parts of the world of diageo in terms of collaborating to actually you know, improve recycling rates, um, you know, and in some cases that involves NGOs, in some cases it involves, uh, you know, collaborating across sectors, but, th but this is definitely a very, uh, a big challenge, um, you know, for, for all for all companies. So it, it is definitely part of the, the innovation gap. That's good. I, I, I noticed here in Indonesia, that, uh, the BKPM recently announced new incentives for the recycling industry. So hopefully uh, the consumer brands 
and the recyclers will be able to drive up a, a much higher percentage of, of recycled content and packaging going forward. What I'd like to do now, um, you talked, Kate talked about uh, more companies working together and industry working together. So uh, in, in that respect, I'd like to invite uh, Mora Garden um, from the Scot Scotch Whiskey Association. She's responsible for uh, sustainability and innovation. So that's quite an appropriate title based on what Kate's been discussing. Uh, Morag, you, you've been listening to what Diageo have been saying. Um, have you got any, any comments or questions for them? And um, would you like to work. maybe just uh, give us an overview of, of what the Scots, Scotch Whiskey Association is doing? Um, thank you, Ainsley. So very, very brief, because you know, there's lots of really great questions. I've been following them on, chat, on the chat. So, you know, so I'm from the Scotch Whiskey Association. We're the trade association body for the Scotch whiskey sector, and we represent 95% of the um, product by value. So, you know, we really do represent the sector. And since 2009, I think we've kind of been on a parallel journey alongside Diageo. Um, we created our environmental strategy, the, the, a sector wide, which was the first one in Scotland. Um, looking back, it was probably very innovative. It just felt the right thing to do at the time. Um, and that was that was environmental one, and that was in 2009, and we set some, some uh, objectives there. And we've now been through several iterations each time being more ambitious, more bold, and bringing in more of, um, you know, moving away from what's within our boundaries of our distilleries and thinking about that wider supply chain. And we've just launched our strategy, uh, our sustainability strategy 2040 in January. And um, so thanks very much for allowing me to come and introduce that. And I can stick uh, a link to our strategy in the, the Q&A so others can, um, and see what we've done there. And in terms of what Diageo is doing, I think, you know, for, for us, one of the real successes of our sustainability strategy is that the Scotch whisky sector has agreed that the environment is non-competitive. And that just allows for knowledge exchange, best practice, um, learning from others. So where our, some, our companies are being pioneers like Diageo and, and others, Ricardi Chavis, you know, they're, 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 they're going along and, and, and taking these bold risks and investments. And we um, work with Diageo and then help the others in the sector understand and learn. And so we all get there quicker, easier, better. And we're all going along that sustainability journey um, together. And just two, two more points, I think. For, I think the three words that describe our sustainability strategy uh, is leadership, innovation and collaboration, which is probably the exact same words that um, Diageo say. And, and I think, you know, for us, I, the, the, the conundrum I had to do to get sign off across all our sectors was to make sure that, you know, it, it supported and complemented the, the individual strategies like Diageo and others have, and, and they felt it was ambitious enough. And, and secondly, it was also for the others who are starting the journey, it was ambitious, but achievable. And I feel we've, we've, we've delivered that. And, and thanks for putting the slide up in that. We're, we cover the same broad areas as Diageo, which is about net zero, being careful with our water, thinking about our packaging, and um, you know, looking at our, the land that we use via peat and cereals. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just looking through some of the questions. There's a couple of themes here. We, uh, Rich Am Indonesia has got a number of, of companies who are involved in innovation, particularly in clean energy. And they've asked, can they get in touch with the Agio? So would it be appropriate to put them in touch with Dendi in the first place? Yeah. Okay. So that deals. Yeah. Um, and we've got another, another question here from um, someone who's well known to Britch, I'm Alistair Spears. He says he has a program for restaurants called Say Yes to Less to reduce all waste coming out of venues. Is this something that Diageo can support? Apparently he's got 500 F&B outlets, most of whom will be your customers. So presumably uh, Alistair can get in touch with, with Dendi to discuss that. Uh, some other people have asked whether or not the presentation will be uh, available. It will be. Um, uh, 
the video of this uh, this webinar will be, be available on the, the Britcham website and the Britcham uh, YouTube channel, so everyone will be able to get access to it. A um, couple of other questions here about water uh, conservation. I think one from David Braithwaite. Uh, he's asking for some examples of how you, you aim to replenish more water than you use in your operations in 100% of local communities. Uh, is it linked to partnerships and new technologies? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a great that's a great question. And so the, the way we think about um, the way we think about water stewardship is in our own operations, first and foremost. So it's around what can we do in order to drive more and more water efficiency. So we've already achieved 40 46 percent improvement in water efficiency around the world up to 2020. And our aim is to do a further 30 percent by 2030 uh, of, and with 40 percent in water stressed areas. Obviously, water is very context specific. And then as we think about replenishment, what we, we work with um, communities near to our operational sites and also communities where we're sourcing uh, local raw materials. And we do replenishment through a number of different ways. So we do things like um, tree planting, which helps to stabilize the soil and the water. Uh, and it's also that's great for, for carbon capture as well. Uh, Desilting of dams. Um, and then we do a lot of work in terms of water sanitation and hygiene projects. And certainly one thing that we've seen during the pandemic is that you know the access to uh, to clean water and sanitation is absolutely critical. Um, you know, and I think one of the things we've seen with SDG six um, is actually the, the the absence of of easy access to clean water and sanitation really holds communities back. Um, so all, all the goals are absolutely critical, but but the the, the need for really accelerating access on SDG 6 is, is so important um, because obviously time spent getting water is, is you know is time spent away from things like education and, uh, and employment. So, so that, that's the way that we do it. And then the other thing that we're doing is um, a lot of the challenges in terms of water stress are at the basin level. So it actually requires collaboration uh, for all of those that are using uh, the water basin. So it's not enough just to uh, to, to you know to work in the four walls or even in your local area we actually have to collaborate uh, at the basin level so quite a big challenge but uh, sure. again sure. massive opportunity great um i'd like to invite someone else to come on and, and uh, ask a question caroline craggs who looks after scottish development international in southeast asia she's been working with dendy over the last few months on some of the food and drink initiatives um, in this region welcome caroline Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, ho ho hopefully, what you've heard might be able to you might be able to incorporate into some of your future campaigns to drive absolutely. more volume in this area. Absolutely, and great to hear what's going on in uh, in terms of sustainability. Um, one of my questions that I was keen to ask was, um, working for a government organisation, is there anything that you would want more of um, in terms of collaboration from us? Is there more that we could do to support you? Um, and then uh, also around innovation. Um, there's some really uh, dynamic challenger brands that are really doing a lot in, in the innovation space. And you talk about collaboration. I'm just wondering, where do you see those challenger brands in terms of fitting in with uh, some of the work that the larger multinational corporations are doing. Well, I certainly, I was, um, you know, very, very struck by by what Morag was saying around the environment being, you know, not being a competitive area, which I completely agree with. So I think, you know, the the, the reality is, is we need more, uh, you know, more new approaches and innovations to be developed faster, um, you know, and to be supported so they can be commercialized. So I would say. You know, the more the better, frankly. Um, you know, so there obviously lots of lots of companies are doing. Um, you know, you, you know, we're we're innovating in, in our own operations. We're you know we're working with suppliers, etc. But but I you know, and I think with regards to to government, I think it's around um, you know clear uh, clear roadmaps and kind of consistent messaging. Yeah, and, and it's those market signals, right? Because we we, we need to make sure that. Um, you know, the, the more the more the awareness of the need to really transform really, really fast, and that's the pennies dropping everywhere, um, the more we need to make sure that, you know, we can invest and we can have a consistent policy and signals so that, you know, because these things, you know, this is not a not a quick fix. Um, you know, these are multi year journeys. So I think that would be that that would be the ask. Thank you. Can I, would I be also be able to jump in just really quickly. So one of the other things I agree with everything that um, Kate says exactly all those points and I just an, an additional one would be 
um, that recently there was a green distillers competition which was funded through the UK government and supported very much in, in, in Scotland as well. And, and it was focused as obviously by the name Distillers. And you know, a great number of our member companies were successful in the bids for there. And so a number of our companies are looking at hydrogen, high pressure, heat pumps. And because they're these demonstration and pilots are, are feasibility, you know, the whole range is being kind of driven through government. Um, we are also going to learn from it as a sector because it will be open information and you know so we'll, as a sector we're really excited about um, you know some of our members participating in this because it feels like we're all participating in it so that that was another great um, area and I feel you know advance in packaging and other things if there was these kind of calls for research we could work really collaboratively to try and, and find the solutions to our challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dendi, I, I've, just come, I've just come up with an idea with your Rich Arm board member hat on. Maybe we could create a, a forum for some of these in, um, innovative companies here in Indonesia, whether it be UK companies operating here or Indonesian companies, to pitch some of their ideas to, to companies like Diageo, to see whether or not there, there is technology out there that's being ad adapted here or looking to come here. Which could be appropriate for you. Totally, you totally that? agree on that answer, and then let's let's follow up soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for agreeing to that, Dendi. Um, finally, I, I, conscious of the time, our hour is almost up. Kate, I, I would like to to go all the way back to to the beginning of my introduction, and I referenced the fact that the Azure were, were um, a UN Sustainability Goal business avenger. Can you maybe just share a little bit about of your, your work in respect of the business Avengers and what Diageo hope to get out of the, the UN Climate Change Conference? Sure, um, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so I think that the, what, what really uh, struck us with the business Avengers was a couple of things. One is this real recognition that the private sector has a major role to play uh, alongside others in delivering the goals. Um, and then also, so as business Avengers, so as we mentioned before, we're badged against SDG6 and, and other business Avenger companies, which include uh, you know, Unilever, Microsoft, Nike, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, Google, SAP, there's a, there's a, there's a number of us. Um, we also work together uh, and we do, we do things uh, in a number of ways. One is we share learnings, uh, we share best practice, uh, you know, we, we motivate each other, you know, and, um, and we're also really committed to making sure that the sustainable development goals remain top of mind. Um, I think one thing that's encouraging, so even though we're living through an absolutely terrible and devastating crisis, I think that, 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 that what's encouraging is that the, as, the, as the vulnerability or as the uh, fragility, let's say, of, of, of our systems becomes clear, um, these issues haven't gone to the back burner. They're actually coming into, you know, they're really coming into and in, in staying in the mainstream. So that, that's helpful. And so I think our collective mission as well, as we, as we begin to emerge from the crisis and think about recovery is that we don't spend time going, gosh, what should we focus on? You know, the sustainable development goals are the roadmap to follow. Um, they are the way to build resilience, to prepare for future shocks and to create the world we want to see. So we also collectively are committed to making sure that the goals remain famous uh, and, and really understood by everybody, uh, you know, and that, that's obviously a very big, uh, bold ambition. And then with regards to COP26, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously all recognizing just the huge importance of, of that meeting. So uh, I think it's really making sure that, um, the groundwork is laid. The fact that that meeting was delayed by a year due to COVID in some ways is helpful in the sense that there is more groundwork that can be laid. Uh, it's very encouraging to see the number of uh, countries now coming out with net zero commitments. You know, more than uh, you know, 50% of of, uh, of global emissions are now covered. And 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 I think also you know having the U.S. come back into the Paris Agreement, I'm sure we would all agree, is is a very positive signal. So Diageo is also part of the. Um, the COP26 business leaders group uh, in the lead up to that. So um, I think what we want to see coming out of that meeting is you know, bold ambition, some of those market signals, a recognition that it needs to be a fair transition. Um, and and you know, really, I think also just making sure that recovery packages are really investing in this low carbon world that we need to move to. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Very good the US is back in the fold. And I think this time around, 
the, the role of business uh, is, is going to be very, very important because ultimately I think business are going to dr drive a lot of these, uh, these goals. Um, can't just rely on governments. We need government support, but business is going to have to show more leadership. And it's great to have our friends from Diageo today to share um, their sustainability goals and to talk about it in much more detail. Um, I very much look forward to hopefully seeing you, Kate, in Glasgow later this Absolutely. year. Maybe uh, Dendi will come as well. He hasn't been there for a while. I don't even know if he's ever been there, but hopefully he can, he can come. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining. I think the, the, the messages today from Diageo, De first, first and foremost, was very positive messaging. I like the idea that you don't quite know how you're going to get there, but you're going to embrace innovation and you're you're really open to innovation. That's a great message, I think, to to also send your your staff, your your colleagues. Yeah, it's, an, it's an exciting environment to, to live in, uh, to work in, sorry. Um, so I wish you all the best with that. I would also like to, to thank the Scot Scots Whiskey Association, Morag for joining, Caroline from, from SDI. The contents of this webinar, as I say, will be available on the Britcham website. We'll be doing another one of these webinars at the end of the month. Um, and I'm pleased to confirm it will be with Coca-Cola. Um, so I'm sure there's going to be an awful lot of questions on plastic, American plastic waste, and we have all the executives here. Um, but it's an important conversation to have, as Kate said, to keep, keep these sustainability goals in the forefront of people's minds talk about it in more detail and to try and work collaboratively. So once again, I'd like to thank Biagio very much for participating today. Wish you all the best in your spirit of progress 2030 targets. We'll maybe get you back again in a couple of years to see how you're getting on. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.